I'm super excited that you're joining us for this brand new series that I'm calling Encounters. Now listen, guys, here's the big idea. That the God of the universe, through his son Jesus, is seeking to have dramatic encounters with people, every person on the planet, all across the globe, uh, especially in this season and in this time. And, I, and not just any kind of encounter. Uh, God is seeking to have the kind of encounters that will radically change our understanding of who we are and our understanding of the very places that we hold in the world. In short, Jesus is seeking an encounter with you. Yes, you. Even though you've been in the church for 20, 30, 40 years, you've been uh, an active Christian, Jesus is saying, in this slice of history, uh, I, I want to engage you in a way that takes you deeper, to give you a greater revelation of who he is for this slice of history. Yeah, Jesus is seeking you, the person who's been thinking about faith. Maybe you're new to the faith. And that curiosity that has brought you to this point, well, that's the work of Jesus saying, I want you to lean in. I, I, I want you to engage with me in a way that radically changes your sense of personal identity and your place and purpose in the world, especially, can you say especially, in this slice of history. Now, here's the deal. Jesus has been at work moving across the globe looking for uh, life transformative encounters forever. The challenge is our hearts and minds are not always open. And so he's knocking on our door and we often miss it. You know, when you read about Jesus in the Gospels, when he's introduced to us, all of the Gospels make this point. That Jesus shows up on the scene, reaching out and initiating encounters with people. Now that's, a, that's a, an insight I want you to get. The encounters I'm talking about, these are Jesus-initiated encounters. And after his ministry of three and a half years was over death and resurrection, uh, the, the gospel writer John, he kind of summarizes this, 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 this coming into the world, looking to overtake the lives of people and radically change who they understand themselves to be in their place. And here's how the gospel writer summarizes it, summarizes it in John. Uh, he says this, he says, listen, he, meaning Jesus, came into the very world that he created, but the world didn't recognize him came to his own people, and even they rejected him. They were Jesus knocking on the door of their lives. They totally don't recognize who he is. But then here comes this amazing statement. It says, ultimately, but to all, can you shout all, all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right, the authority, the paperwork, if you will, to become children of God. And in this unique and peculiar slice of history, I'm saying to you that, that, that Jesus is at work activating, mobilizing the children of God, and we are desperately needed now like never, ever before. Yes, Jesus is seeking an encounter with you. So once a year, the church across the world sets aside a season, they call it Lent, because they are aware of the fact that our minds and hearts can be closed to Jesus trying to move us into deeper places. And so it's 40 days of prayer and fasting. We commemorated the beginning of that earlier this week on Wednesday night. We had an Ash Wednesday service. It was a wonderful virtual service. But this coming Wednesday night, March the 9th, we kick off our 40 days of prayer and fasting. We call it our PF40 journey. And even if you're just joining us for the very first time, I want to invite you to, to engage in a time of prayer and fasting starting Wednesday. Join with us uh, as we journey towards Easter. Now listen, when you fast, you can fast a certain meal a day, maybe your favorite meal a day, or you can fast coffee or candy or, you know, the things that you really, really love. Maybe it's social media. For me, guess what? I'm fasting the Golden State Warriors. You know I must love God. <laughs> if you know anything about me, man, I, 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 I love me some Warriors. But in, in their move towards the playoff, I'm going to not watch them. I'm turning the TV off. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take that hour and a half, a, a huge portion of that time, that I'm usually watching and cheering for the Warriors, 
And I'm going to lean in, in scripture and in prayer, opening my heart and opening my mind, because I can sense Jesus is saying, I want a greater encounter with you. Because we're all moving into a time in this world that is unique and unusual and different. And if there ever was a time that we need to be deeply anchored in who Jesus is and what is he calling us to do and be, that time is now. So I invite you. I'll talk more about this PF40 at the end of this message. Now, I can almost hear some of you say, you're not saying it, but I can sense it in the groans, perhaps, that you're really jaded. And when you hear language of Jesus and encountering with him and radically changing people's sense of who they are and their place in the world, you're kind of jaded. I get it. Some of you may be jaded because over the last two years, you expected Jesus followers to stand up and to engage uh, in a world that was being overtaken by injustice and so forth and so on. And you saw Jesus' followers being quiet and apathetic, and you just got jaded. Or maybe you saw people in the name of Jesus engaging politically, but the way they engaged were uh, totally in contradiction with uh, your understanding of who God is and what Jesus is about. And so you got jaded. Or just maybe... You've got a friend or a classmate or a family member that's always talking about God, always talking about church. But you know how they handle their business affairs and, and how they do that with limited integrity. Uh, you know how they mistreat people that they should be loving in their lives. You see it regularly, and you're just jaded about this thing about encounters with Jesus and changing lives. You're just kind of jaded. And yet... We live in a world that has been shaped and is continuing being shaped by people who Jesus has overtaken and transformed their lives radically. For example, we all know the name Mother Teresa. If Mother Teresa was here today, she would tell you that the first time that Jesus initiated an encounter with her, she was 12 years old. It was at that time he made it clear to her that he was calling her uh, to care for the poor. The second time he initiated a, a deeper encounter with her, she was 17 years old. And it was at that moment in response to that encounter that she took a vow of chastity and poverty and committed herself to being a missionary for the church. The third time that she encountered, that Jesus overtook her with a, with a transformative encounter. Note this, each time it changes her understanding of herself and her place in the world. The third time is at 36 years of age. She calls it a call in the middle of a call. She's on a train leaving Calcutta and, and, and Jesus crystallizes for her that she is to leave the safe confines of the convent that she's working in, in Calcutta. And she is not just to care for the poor. She is to care for the poorest of the poor. You see how that further encounters crystallizes the call. And it was Mother Teresa who gave birth to the missionary of charities. And today, thousands of women who have taken vows of chastity and poverty are in the most difficult places of the world, caring for the sick and the disease, caring for those coming out of prostitution and drug addiction, caring for refugees, caring for the aging and those who are in convalescent, being the hands and the feet and the hearts of Jesus in the world, having their lives radically reoriented, not, not because they are Mother Teresa's, but because they're individuals who Jesus have overtaken their lives, some subtly and some dramatically. It's changed how they understand themselves, who they understand themselves to be, and their place in the world. There I say again, Jesus is seeking an encounter with you. So the day I want to start, I want to look at a passage of Scripture that really highlights a unique encounter. See, because Jesus' encounter with us are always unique, and, 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 and they come in ways that really, uh, again, helps us to to redefine how we understand ourselves in the world. And this encounter is focused on the person called Peter. Peter's one of the first disciples that Jesus overtook. He was a Jewish fisherman. Jesus found him and he says, come follow me. And he called Peter. And Peter has been with Jesus for three and a half years. He's known Jesus. He's been in relationship with him for three and a half years. I want you to keep that in mind for three and a half years. But at this point, 
where the text kicks in, uh, something has radically shifted in the world around Peter. And, and he is going to require a different kind of encounter with Jesus in order to be prepared to engage with the future. Listen to this text as it picks, kicks off. It says this. So they arrested him, meaning Jesus, and led him to the high priest's home. And Peter followed at a distance. The guards lit a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat around it. And Peter joined them there. A servant girl noticed him in the firelight, began staring at him. Finally, she says, this man was one of Jesus' followers. But Peter denied it. First time he denies it. Woman, he says, I don't even know him. After a while, someone else looked at him and said, you must be one of them. And again, Peter retorts, no, man, I'm not. Second denial. About an hour later, someone else insisted, this must be one of them because he is a Galilean also. But Peter says for the third time, man, I don't know what you're talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. At that moment, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Evidently, Jesus is coming out of, out of, the, out of the place where he's just finished uh, in being interrogated in, in a jury rig court. And he looks at Peter. And suddenly, the Lord's words flash through Peter's mind. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny me three times. That you even know me. You will deny three times that you even know me. And then the text says, Peter left the courtyard weeping bitterly. Weeping bitterly. Let's begin here. Notice how the text starts with the words, so they arrested him. Him referring to Jesus. Now let me just ask you a question. Why would people arrest Jesus? When all he did was uh, to give sight to the blind and heal the sick and feed the hungry, evict demonic forces out of the lives of people, setting folk free. Why arrest Jesus when all he did was do the work of, of, of love on the planet? Well, you know why they arrested Jesus? Fear. Can you just type that in the chat and can you just say it out loud if you're listening? Can you just say fear? You know, fear is a dangerous thing. Here's what happened. Uh, Jesus was, had showed up and he said he was the son of God. In other words, he says that, 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 that I'm God in your neighborhood. I'm God in the hood. And he backed it up with all these incredible miracles of love, healing, and, and caring for people along the way. And as he did... Crowds flocked to Jesus, which meant they, they, they left the traditional center of religious power. And as the, as the people who were in those traditional centers of power was watching all of the people go to Jesus and seeing him becoming more and more popular and more and more powerful, they became afraid that they were going to be disempowered. And so as a result of that mind-bending fear, they ended up arresting Jesus for counterfeit charges that he didn't do. Forced him to walk through jerry-rigged court systems where the decision was already made even before he entered the courtroom. And they sentenced him to death because of their fear. Can somebody say fear? Yeah. You know, fear is a dangerous thing. And so let me ask you. What is your greatest fear? Because as Jesus reaches out to encounter our lives, oftentimes he calls us, forces us to confront the, the greatest fears that are in our lives, the unprocessed fears, the un, inarticulated fears, the fears that can drive us to places of insanity if we're not careful. We're watching this work itself out in the world in which we're living today, are we not? Tanks are rolling across Ukraine. Bombs are dropping. People innocently are being killed by the thousands. 
Not because Ukraine attacked Russia, but because Mr. Putin has been gripped by fear. <laughs> if Ukraine joined NATO, then NATO is closer to, to the edge of his power base, he may be disempowered. And so now the whole world, because he's afraid, has come to the brink, have come to the brink. Fear is a dangerous thing. Are you in touch with your greatest fears? You know, you don't have to look at Ukraine to figure this out, how dangerous fears are, right? You can look right here in America. You know, I'll just say this about both parties, this is true, at, at varying degrees, that there are politicians who are saying things every day that they know are not true. They're passing policies in this country every day that even they don't believe in, but they're doing it because they are afraid of, the, of their basis. Because if they do what's right for the country, they feel like their base will throw them out of power. And so they rather sell the country down the drain rather than do what is Right. That is the power of fear. Fear is a dangerous thing. And as I watch the news, I, I, I kind of surmise, you know, America's downfall probably will not come because nuclear missiles will attack us from outside. It probably will happen if we're not careful because fear has gone nuclear across the land inside. Are you in touch with your fear? That's the question. Well, when we meet Peter in this particular context, in this slice of history, and I want to just keep talking about this slice of history, uh, this unique time, because I believe we're living in a unique slice of history that, 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 that requires the children of God to become visible and to become mobilized and to confront all of the different levels that fear us at work in our lives. Yeah, this slice of history, shout, this slice of history. We meet Peter. He is introduced to us as a person of fear. We meet a fearful Peter in the text. Notice the text says that Peter uh, followed at a distance. You see that? Jesus is, is, uh, is being interrogated and, and he's headed towards really crucifixion. And Peter's trying to keep an eye on it, but he's frightened. He's afraid. He doesn't want anybody to know that he's associated with him. Jesus now, what is fascinating about this is that this is uncharacteristically Peter. That when Jesus calls Peter forth, he's a Jewish fisherman. He's known, you know, he's in that Jewish tradition, that fisherman tradition, you might imagine. He's probably a brawler. He probably can hold his liquor really well. We know from reading scripture that he will cuss you because the, the various gospel writers describing this, uh, the, the Greeks suggest that at certain points when he denied you, he literally cursed folk out and he would also cut you. Come on, just earlier before this, this event, he sliced a man. Uh, 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 ear off. So he, Peter was a guy that will cuss you, cut you. Come on now. He, he, he was, uh, he, it's, it's not natural for him to be not dominated by fear. It's uncharacteristic. As a matter of fact, earlier that evening, and Jesus and the disciples were sitting around the table and Jesus was talking about what was going to take place. And he says to Peter, he calls him by a surname, Simon. He says, listen, he says, Satan wants to sift you. He says, but be of good courage. I've prayed for you. And when you've repented, turn and help your brothers. And Peter is offended. <laughs> he looks at Jesus. He says, look, Lord, I'm ready to go to prison with you and even to die with you. Yeah, we'll die with you. And Peter meant every word. And Jesus looks at Peter very compassionately. And he, in a sense, he says, he says, Peter, let me tell you something. I, I know you mean what you said, but, but, but something is going to drop into your life that you've never experienced before, and it's going to cause fear to explode in a way that you've never experienced before, and it's going to land right at the center of your place of faith. And, and check it out. I just want you to know, before the rooster crows signaling that it's morning time tomorrow, you will deny me, not once, not twice, but three times. You'll say to people, I don't even know him. And you're going to do what's uncharacteristically you, 
because you're going to find yourself in an uncharacteristic era, in an uncharacteristic time. And I want you guys to listen to me now because I know God is speaking to some of us. We've awakened in a world that is uncharacteristic, that stuff have dropped in our lives that have caused, that have challenged us at the very core of our faith. And we find ourselves acting in ways that people around us say, I don't know you. you you're, you're, you're acting differently at home. You're acting differently at work. You're turning on people that you normally love and, 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 and you're cutting people out of your life that you're normally connected to. But you're kind of weird. What's going on? And somebody say fear. Fear. Let me just suggest to you a few ways that fear operates in our lives. First of all, fear will threaten our dreams and undermine our dreams. You're the person who really wants to write a book, but, but, but because of being afraid that uh, no one will buy or read the book, you've never started to write it. Fear will hold us back from the things that God has for us. You're the person that's in a lousy relationship. You know it's lousy. It's, 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 it's not healthy or helpful for you. But because you're afraid of being alone, or afraid that, there will, that there's no one else to love you, you just stay in that lousy relationship. And it's holding you back. Your fear. And fear will drive you to do the maddening and the unthinkable Putin is doing the unthinkable and putting his whole nation and the whole world at, at risk. American politicians every day are doing the unthinkable and putting our nation at risk. Peter did the unthinkable. The first time he was asked, do you know Jesus? He said, no. The second time, do you know Jesus? He said, no. The third time, do you know Jesus? He said, no. He denied him. The one that he loved that he said, I'll go, to, I'll, I'll go to prison with you. I'll do it for you. But he did the unthinkable. That's what fear would do in your life. So I ask you again, what is your greatest fear? Are you able to articulate it and call it out? Can you handle it or is it handling you? Are you able to surrender it and submit it? To Jesus, what is your greatest? I want you to list out your greatest fear. And so Peter, three times, he denies that he even knows Jesus. And then the text says this. Suddenly, the Lord's words flash through Peter's mind. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny me three times. You will deny three times that you even know me. And the text says, and Peter left the courtyard weeping bitterly. He had done the unthinkable because of unmitigated fear at work in his life. Wow. Now, I just want to point out two real quick things. I'm coming to the end of today's message. It's about confronting fear because of our encounters with Jesus. The first thing I want to point out uh, is that Peter had a right to be fearful. Fear arrested Jesus. Fear was going to crucify Jesus. Fear was looking for Jesus' uh, uh, leadership team with the intent to eliminate them. Uh, Peter had a right to be fearful. He had a right because it was possible for Peter to lose his life. The difference between Jesus and Peter, though, is that Jesus concluded that there are some things literally worth facing your fear and dying for. Mainly, he concluded you were worth his dying for. Peter was worth his dying for. That I and we are worth his dying for, his suffering for. And my dear friends, I'm praying that we all will have encounters with Jesus that will help us to clarify what is it that's worth, that we have that's worth living for and what is it we have that's worth dying for. And I, I just want to suggest that, that as we move into this new slice of history, there will come perhaps times that we may have to make the decision, you know, 
know what? There are some things worth losing a boyfriend or girlfriend over because of our values. Come on now. And our faith posture. There are some things worth losing a job over because of our value and our commitment to Jesus. There are some things worth losing perhaps our lives for. Rather than hiding and always wanting to be accepted and loved, sometimes. But in order to get to that place, you got to have an antidote for fear. This brings me to my final point here today. I want you to lean in on this. Listen, Peter had a relationship with Jesus for three and a half years. He spent every day of his life with Jesus for three and a half years. And yet that relationship that he had with Jesus for three and a half years was not sufficient to be an antidote when Peter faced his greatest fear. It was not because his relationship was with the pre-crucified Jesus. Come on now. Uh, yeah, the pre-resurrected Jesus. But now he needed a different kind of encounter with a different perspective and a different aspect of Jesus. And I love, I love how, the, how the text moves forward. The story unfolds from here. Jesus is crucified on Sunday morning. The women show up at the tomb. The stone has been rolled away. There's an angel there that says to the ladies, says, why are you looking for the, for the, for the living among the place of the dead? He, Jesus, is not here. He has risen as he said. And then, he's, then the angel says, but he left a message for me to give to you. And the message is simply this. He said to, for you to go back and tell, watch this, his disciples and Peter. Can you shout and Peter? That's my favorite verses. And Peter, that he's going ahead of you into Galilee and he will see you and they will see him there. There you'll see him. Just as he told you. Wow. Okay, real quick, real quick, real quick. My gosh. The first word is that we need an encounter with Jesus as we, as we lean into our PF40. We're seeking an encounter with Jesus that, that will, 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 will equip us to move forward knowing that whatever we walk into tomorrow or next year, that he has gone ahead of us and there we will see him. Whatever suffering, whatever challenge, there we will see him. He'll, he, he's, he's got us. He'll empower. But the second, the second, the second, the second insight is that, is that we will have an encounter with Jesus that will be so incredibly radical transformational that it'll be an antidote for our fear. All right, here's what I mean. An antidote for your fear. Here's what I mean. Peter gets the word and along with the disciples, they go find Jesus in Galilee. And they experience the resurrected Jesus. He, was, he who was dead is now alive. And suddenly, they discovered this point right here. Come on now. Knowing Jesus is the ultimate antidote for our greatest fears. Knowing the resurrected Jesus is the ultimate antidote for our greatest fears. Because in a relationship with the resurrected Jesus, here's what Peter discovered. He was looking at Jesus. He who was dead is now alive. And, and, and here's what he discovered. He discovered in Jesus a life that cannot be destroyed. Did you hear Jesus say, I am the life and the resurrection. Anyone who believeth in me, though you die, you shall live again. So many of us are afraid to do the right thing because we're afraid of death. But in Jesus is a life that cannot be destroyed. And then, of course, as he encounters Jesus, there Jesus restores him. You know, it's wonderful. It's found in, in chapter 21 of the Gospel of John, this encounter between Peter and Jesus uh, in the resurrected Christ. He talks with Peter three times. He asks Peter a question. Remember, Peter denied Jesus three times. And now the, the reconciliation is coming in three questions. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And Peter's ultimate answer is, Lord, you know I do. And in that moment, Peter is experiencing a transformation 
And in that moment, Jesus in, uh, 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 installs Peter really as the first pastor of what will become the beginning of the worldwide church. He says, Peter, I want you to lead it because now you know my grace, you know my power. And, and, and in that moment, Peter discovers in Jesus not only a life that cannot be destroyed, but he discovers in Jesus a love that cannot be diminished. Come on now. And, 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 and despite all that he did, all of the betrayal, all of the mess up that he did, rather than Jesus, Jesus rejecting him. Come on, Jesus embraces him and installs him and empowers him. And suddenly the words come true that Paul would quote later on. What can separate us from the love of God? And the answer is, there is nothing in creation, in heaven, up below the earth, that can ever separate us from the love of God. Where? Revealed in Jesus Christ. A love that cannot be diminished. Yeah. Some of your friends may walk out on you. Your girlfriend might leave you, but stand for Jesus, for a Jesus purpose, inspired by a Jesus encounter that overtook your life. And you'll find that the most important person in creation, his love cannot be diminished. It can't. He loves you with an everlasting love. That, my friends... That's the antidote to your fear. Wow. All right, I'm going to end here. We'll pick back up this next week. But let me just invite you. You know, the one who said, uh, tell my disciples and Peter, you know, I've gone and hit them. I'll see them in Galilee. The, the, the angel, you know what he was doing? He was, he, in a sense, priming a pump. He was saying to them that Jesus is saying, come look for him. Come seek him. He's going to be waiting for you. Come look for him. Come seek him. And that's what our PF40 journey is all about over the course of the next 40 years, that, 40 days that we're going to start on Wednesday uh, night. It's, it's Jesus saying, come seek me. Come look for me. So let me just tell you how to engage. I hope you will engage. Let me tell you three ways to engage very quickly. First of all, I want you to keep at the forefront of your mind the word remember. I want you to remember the card starting Wednesday night. If you're in our local campuses, there's a physical card for you. We also have a PDF on our website, and we certainly have a card in our app. And if you don't have our app, I want to encourage you to go ahead and download our app right now. And there in the app, you'll see our PF40 card. And when you tap that PF40 card, you're going to see two sections designated. The first is a, a prayer and fasting overview, everything you need to know to begin to pray and fast. And then the second is a prayer list, because during the next 40 days, I don't want you to just be focused on yourself. I want you to think about family and friends and other loved ones who need to experience the miraculous power of God being released in their lives, who needs to have an encounter. Jesus wants an encounter with them as well. So list those people out. And then there's a space there for you to specifically say, here's what I'm hoping you do for me, Jesus. Over the course of the next 40 days, remember the card. Secondly, I want you to remember designate. Designate a place and a time that you're going to go return to each day, a chair, a room, at work, at home, or a place in the park at where you're going to prepare to engage with a God who wants to have an encounter with you. And then lastly, I want you to connect with God. Now here's where I'm willing to help you. If you sign up right now today to be a part of our PF40 campaign, I will send you every single day of the 40-day journey an email that includes a prayer that you can pray, a scripture that you can read and reflect on, sometimes a spiritual exercise for you to engage in to help you to connect with God. You might want to keep a journal and kind of just keep notes of what you're sensing God is saying and doing in your life over the journey. All you got to do is sign up today. We're going to provide you with that opportunity. Now, let me go ahead and help you to sign up. If you scan the QR code right now on the screen, it's going to take you to our connection card. And in our connection card, you're going to find something called message response. I want you to go directly there. And, and here's what, just read this with me. I accept the PF40 challenge and look forward to receiving daily scripture emails from Pastor Herman. If you check that, you are entered into our email database, and starting this Wednesday, you'll get your first email. Check this uh, reflection question out as well. I want you to answer it. Answer it. What is my greatest fear? 
and in what ways does it exercise power over my life? That's going to get you ready because Jesus is waiting to have an encounter with you. Lord, bless us as we prepare for the next 40 days. In Jesus' name, amen.